So it may seem a little bit like deja vu, but we were talking about the fact that in uh, Revelation chapter 11, we have here uh, before us what's actually a little bit of a summary statement uh, or an outline of what is to follow in uh, the remainder of the book of Revelation. And that's exactly where we are headed today. Um, today I'm going to start reading in verse 14 and I'm going to read through to the end of chapter 11. And the word of God says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worship God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for this book that we have here before us. Um, and I felt reminded this morning, because um, often we just speak of this book as being revelation. Uh, and it is an unveiling or a revealing, uh, but specifically this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask that your spirit, the very spirit that inspired these words, uh, will be with us this morning. And help us not only to get your word into our head, but into our hearts as well. And that we would see the glory of our Lord and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that through him you would be glorified. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so in verse 14, we are told that the second woe is past. And if we think back a ways, we may recall that depending on whichever translation of the Bible you're using and whichever manuscript tradition it relies on, uh, back in chapter 8, at the very end of the chapter, in verse 13, there was either an eagle or an angel that was flying through heaven. And the eagle is announcing a, a triple woe. Woe, woe, woe to those who live on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So this triple woe was announced in relation to the last three trumpets which were yet to be sounded. And so we are here told that the second woe is past because the sixth trumpet has been sounded and we are now awaiting the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Just in review, the first woe was the invasion of demonic locusts. The second was a demonic army. And as I said, the third woe is yet to come. So in verse 15, the seventh trumpet is sounded and action begins to take place in heaven. So there's always something that happens in conjunction with the sounding of one of these trumpets. And whereas this is the seventh trumpet, uh, we normally notice that in the seventh uh, judgment, whatever it may be, whether it was the seal judgment or the trumpet judgment, the seventh is a little different from the others. And I have said in previous message that it seems that the best way to understand these is the next series of judgment proceeds out of the seventh of the judgments that... that uh, precedes it. Uh, and I kind of use the idea of a telescope uh, as an illustration. 
So just like you might have a telescope that, that shrinks up, as you pull each section out of the telescope, the next section proceeds out of it. And it seems to me the way this is described in the text, that's the best way to understand these judgments. And so now with the, with the blowing of the seventh trumpet, there will be another series that will proceed following the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And so the action that we see here that takes place in heaven involves these loud voices. <clears throat> and it says, And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the, of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So here is one of many places in scripture uh, that we can find this big picture truth that Jesus is king and that he will reign forever and this is a this is a teaching this is an idea that we find many many places uh, throughout scripture all authority has been given to Jesus and he will reign on the earth so I should note here that in fact some people hold that Jesus will not physically reign on the earth and sometimes they refer back to the to the point that Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world um, but in in my reading of that Jesus what Jesus is saying is is um, the nature of the source of his kingdom is not of this world uh, because his is a heavenly kingdom but that does not mean that his kingdom will not come to pass on the earth in fact in the Lord's Prayer we pray that his kingdom will come and that his will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven so in a way what we see here in Revelation with the coming of Lord Jesus's kingdom is just that it's the answer to our prayer in the Lord's Prayer uh, currently in the world however we have a false ruler scripture tells us and that is why if we look around and we needn't look far uh, we can clearly see that all is not right in the world uh, I think everybody regardless uh, whether they're a believer or not has some kind of a basic understanding that maybe the world isn't just the way that it should be and of course scripture tells us why that is uh, there is a usurper pulling the strings uh, to an extent behind the scenes um, and th trying to thwart God's people um, and th the dealings that take place on the earth. Um, of course, uh, since the fall, uh, the creation has been plunged into sin uh, and has been horribly scarred from the way that God uh, had designed it. But also we have an influence taking place in the world um, by a usurper uh, commonly known as Satan. Uh, in scripture he is given many names. Uh, Satan as I've mentioned he's also called the accuser, the adversary, Beezable, Belial, the dragon as we will see coming up shortly in the book of Revelation. He's also called the tempter the evil one, a roaring lion, the serpent of old, and of course the devil. But he is also called the prince of the powers of the air, the ruler of the demons, and even in scripture he is called the god of this world. But he's said to be the god of this world with a little g, meaning that he is a false god. And in fact scripture tells us that it is Satan who is behind all false religion. So he is God of this world, scripture says, little g, not capital G, like the true God. And so we see his influence all through human history, all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were tempted and then fell, plunging all of creation into sin. All Satan has managed to do, in a sense, is make a royal mess of things. And, uh, but I, I also want to fully state that this does not contradict the fact that we've talked about many, many times through the book of Revelation, that God is sovereign. 
So even Satan's action for his own selfish reasons and purposes end up uh, being used by God and in many cases actually fulfilling God's plan and purposes. Uh, ultimately, Satan does not exist apart from God's knowledge, God's ultimate will, uh, or God's power. Uh, as we read right here in this very text, God is the Almighty. Uh, Satan is not, and God could literally snap his fingers and snuff Satan out at any point uh, that he so chooses. And in fact, as we proceed through the book of Revelation, when God's appointed time comes, we will see just how quickly and easily uh, God deals with Satan when the, when the time comes. Um, I say that just to reiterate and just to clarify, uh, because of some of the ideas that have kind of crept into popular culture, if you will, where what we have here is a battle of two equal forces that are just constantly uh, fighting one another. Uh, so I feel compelled to remind people that Satan is a created being. God is the only one who is eternal, who is self-existent, who is all-powerful, and Satan is a fallen angel who is simply a created being that has decided to go his own way and to try to thwart God seemingly at every opportunity. <clears throat> so when we look back through the record of Scripture, we see uh, that God has actually granted a fairly long leash to both Satan and to sinful humanity. So this isn't to say that even though God is sovereign that people don't make their own choices, because they do. We make choices every single day. Uh, but neither does this cancel out God's sovereignty. So this is one of those big truths of Scripture that can be kind of hard for us to, to hold into our head all at the same time and to kind of rectify for ourselves. Um, but the day is coming when that will come to an end and God will very swiftly and severely deal with the rebellion that has taken place in the world against God and against his sovereign rule. And in fact, Scripture tells us that when that day comes, Christ will return and he will rule with a rod of iron. So uh, that picture for us, ruling with a rod of iron, is a picture for us of the severity and the strictness of the rule of Christ. Uh, all the tomfoolery, as they say, is going to come to an end. Uh, and he has the power um, to make sure that that happens. So verse 15 says that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So we actually see here in the text that this is being told to us before the rest of the text tells us how it happens. And one of the reasons for this is because in God's mind, this is already so assured that he can actually speak of it in the past tense because it's as good as done it just hasn't happened yet. Uh, also quite instructive to us in the text here, notice that it says the kingdom of this world, not the kingdoms of this world. Uh, and I think that holds a wealth of knowledge for us as well. Because in God's eyes, all of the kingdoms of the world, the individual little ones, are really nothing more than different iterations of the one world system that is being uh, again behind the scenes kind of run by the God of this world little g Satan himself uh, human government scripture tells us it was established to be an instrument of God that he uses to keep order uh, in the world however being uh, administered by sinful human beings all human governments in one way, shape, or form seem to fall well short of God's intended standard. And so, given the sinfulness of human beings, uh, I think we would have no hard time admitting that governments tend to be less than perfect. And uh, sometimes, uh, we have seen throughout world history, some governments have done a, a pretty fair job of trying to walk the way God would have them walk and sometimes they have missed the mark by a hundred thousand miles. So um, that is the nature of these governments that are ultimately being administered by 
uh, sinful human beings. Now, Scripture does say that all governments and all authorities exist by the will of God and that they ultimately fulfill his purposes. Um, so we are supposed to, to the degree that we are able, to obey the governmental authorities. Uh, but also, on the same hand, we have texts like the one before us here that also show that these kingdoms are under worldly influences and tend to fall well short uh, of the glory of God, so to speak. <clears throat> and we have seen this carried out through history in many, many different empires, many government structures, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, as scripture presents and as we will see even more clearly later in the book of revelation ultimately all of humanity either belongs to one or the other of these two kingdoms okay so ultimately there are only two real kingdoms the kingdom of god and the kingdom of this world uh, if you will this is really the ultimate and the original tale of two cities because uh, as we proceed through the book of Revelation, we're going to see that we are either citizens of God's kingdom and citizens of the New Jerusalem, or we are citizens in Satan's kingdom and we are citizens of Babylon. And basically that's going to be a major theme that we see keep rolling through the book as we proceed through the book of Revelation. And we are either in one camp or the other. There's no middle ground. I like to say there's no spiritual Switzerland's. Right? Nobody's just going to mind their own business and sit this one out. Um, you're either in one or the other. And no decision is a, de is a decision for Satan. Uh, scripture makes it clear. We become citizens of the kingdom by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and by placing our faith in him. Uh, and that is the only way that we can be saved and become uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And, of course, we're also uh, furthermore adopted into God's very family. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a story from Daniel 2, which I think is very instructive for us here. Uh, in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he has a dream that he's very, very disturbed by. And he approaches his wise men trying to get an interpretation for this dream because he wants to understand what it means. And so he goes to all the wise men in Babylon and nobody is able to tell him his dream. Now in fairness, he did make it extremely hard on them because not only did he want an interpretation of the dream, he wanted them to tell him what he had dreamed in the first place. So usually in scripture, when we see somebody looking for an interpretation, Usually, at least, they'll tell the person what the dream is, which is the case with Joseph, for example. But Nebuchadnezzar says, nope, I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. So his wise men tell him, hey, nobody can do that. In fact, nobody's ever been asked to do that. So Nebuchadnezzar gets a little uh, impatient and decides that he's going to put his wise men to death. This, of course, includes Daniel and his friends. So Daniel approaches Nebuchadnezzar and says, hey, give me just a little bit of time. And scripture clearly teaches that this is the kind of thing that no person can do. This is only something that somebody can do if God grants them the ability to do it. And so Daniel goes back to his friends. Uh, they pray to God and God graciously grants Daniel this vision. And so Dan, Daniel comes to the understanding of exactly what Nebuchadnezzar dreams, and then he is able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what it means. So in his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw this very grand statue. And the statue had a head of gold. It had a chest and arms of silver. It had an abdomen and hips of bronze, legs of iron, and then the feet were a mixture of iron and of clay, it says. And then in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar sees this rock that is carved out of a mountain without hands, the text says. And in the dream, the, the, this rock is cast at the statue. It shatters the feet of the statue, and the entire statue is just pulverized to the point that it disappears. And so Daniel interprets the dream to Nebuchadnezzar, and he tells him, that in this dream, the statue represents 
these kingdoms, these grand empires on the earth. And he says, you are the head of gold. So Babylon is the head of gold. It's traditionally being interpreted that the silver, the torso and the arms, uh, have been interpreted to be the Medo-Persian Empire. The bronze, the, the hips and the thighs of bronze, has been the Greek Empire. The legs of iron were the Roman Empire. And then the feet represent an empire that was not yet in existence. And so, in my view, we are waiting to find out what this empire is. But the clear teaching of this vision and what he tells him is this stone that pulverizes this statue is going to become a kingdom that will never end. Mm -hmm. And so the picture here, and mind you, this, this uh, prophecy was given in the 6th century BC, so 500 years before the incarnation of Christ. Daniel is describing this to King Nebuchadnezzar. And we have seen all of these kingdoms uh, come to pass except for the last one. And so we're waiting for the last one. Uh, it, it's simply uh, amazing when we look at the uh, prophecies in Daniel and we see how many of them have been fulfilled with breathtaking accuracy. Uh, and in my view, that is very good reason for us to have confidence in the ones that are yet to be uh, fulfilled. So we see here that his teaching to him was all of these earthly kingdoms would be destroyed and would be replaced by an eternal kingdom that will never end. And this, of course, is the picture that we have before us here in chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to read to you the end of Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Just as you saw that a stone was broken off from the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is certain and its interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, you can take this to the bank. It's as good as done. <clears throat> uh, as we read here in verse 15 of Revelation 11, and as Daniel tells us, God uh, promised that such a kingdom would exist. And in fact, he told King David that one of his ancestors would become a king and that his kingdom would have no end. And of course, this speaks of one and the same of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Um, the same idea is also found in Daniel's vision in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. That reads, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom, so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And of course, Jesus... Uh, his favorite name for himself was the Son of Man. And he attributed this text to be a reference to himself on many, many occasions. And so verse 17, we find the 24 elders representing believers on their faces praising God with the following. <coughs> Excuse me, and please bear with me because my voice is starting to... My voice is starting to... Uh, struggle here a little bit we give you thanks O Lord God the Almighty who are and who were because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign and the nations were enraged and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged and the time to reward your bond servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name the small and the great and to destroy those who destroy the earth 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> so as we see here, in their praise of the Almighty, not everyone is joyous and excited about the reign of Christ. Uh, we have seen that throughout time, and there are people who are very resistant to the idea that Jesus is Lord. Uh, because quite frankly, some people want to be Lord of themselves, and they don't want to give any authority to anyone else. Um, so not everybody uh, is excited about the idea of the reign of Christ. And in fact, the idea infuriates some uh, as they are fundamentally opposed to him. And this is the very subject that we find in Psalm 2. Why are the nations restless and the people plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Resistance, as they say, is futile. Whether we uh, recognize Jesus as Lord, whether we believe Jesus as Lord, has no bearing whatsoever on the truth of the fact that it is so. Uh, so whether people, you know, some people act like truth is a relative thing. This is a very popular thing in our time. That, you know, you can have your truth and I can have my truth and, and everybody can be happy. But truth doesn't work that way. Because truth either is or it is not. And it's not, is and is not at the same time. And so the idea that some, some person cannot believe in Christ and therefore not be under his authority holds no water whatsoever. Uh, as we read in Philippians 2, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And eventually that will either happen willingly or it will happen unwillingly because Jesus is Lord and the time for us to uh, be in rebellion is short because Christ is coming back and he will put an end to the rebellion. The elders also speak of the time for believers to be rewarded and the wicked and unbelieving to be punished. Uh, all the things that Revelation will continue to describe for us as we continue through. Um, and we will see exactly how that takes place and everything as we continue through the last chapters here in Revelation. So in verse 19, we have the following amazing vision. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So there are many different ways that we could understand this vision. Uh, one such way, and I don't think that we need to be exclusive about any one of them. I think they all work very well together. Uh, there was a tradition uh, in Jewish thought that God had hidden the Ark of the Covenant and at the end of history it would be revealed. And so this to some may signal that this is talking about God bringing about uh, the end of history as we know it, so to speak, which is really just a glorious beginning. Uh, it also... Uh, speaks, I believe, to the revelation of the glory of God. Uh, as we talked about when we went through the book of Hebrews, the Ark of the Covenant was located in the very middle of the temple in the Holy of Holies, where the, where the average everyday believer in God could never see it. It was hidden away, and only the high priest was allowed to go in there where the glory of God uh, appeared above the ark and not the everyday Jewish person. And one of the great truths of the, the book of Hebrews is, is that is all passed away and because of the work of Christ we are all going to be partakers of that glory of God. 
In fact, it was Jesus' prayer in his high priestly prayer in John 17 that we would be where he is so that we could behold his glory. Uh, God is very concerned about his glory and we are to be very concerned about the glory of God as well. And of course, God is glorified uh, when we are raptured by his glory. Uh, when we are amazed by who he is, by his character and person. And so that's one of the great truths that we see here is God is going to bring this all to culmination uh, where all of God's people are joined together and get to behold uh, his glory. Um, and as I said, this is one of those big picture truths and one of the reasons why I find the book of Revelation uh, to be such an encouraging book is it's chock full of these big picture truths, the things that I think that we need to stay focused on uh, because as we go through our everyday life, uh, it's very easy for us to look at the way things are going and become discouraged. Um, and God gives us the truth of his word to paint these glorious pictures for us, uh, I believe, to keep us going. Uh, in fact, scripture said that... Um, uh, Jesus kept going because of the joy that he could see that was laid before him. Uh, despite all the hardship that Jesus went through, he knew what was awaiting at the end, that he was going to be redeeming uh, you and I so that we could be with him forever. And that same idea, that same focusing on the future, what the future holds for us, um, is important for us as a driving force. Because uh, it's very easy in our everyday life just to get dragged down by everyday things and then lose sight of the big picture. And that's one of the things that um, I think that the book of Revelation helps us uh, to stay focused on is um, the idea that God has a plan and he is working it all towards this glorious end, which we will get to be a part of if we simply keep the faith and keep believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, let's close in prayer. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this truth, uh, this encouraging truth that uh, <clears throat> Jesus is the one true king and he will come and reign on the earth and make all that is wrong right. Uh, he will right everything that has gone awry through the fall, uh, through the workings of uh, the God of this world. And you are going to make all things right and justice will be served. Uh, Father, keep us focused on these great truths uh, as we go about the work of sharing your word, uh, as we try to bring more and more people into this wonderful kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday.